Hi. Hi. I was thinking you guys should eat once before. Uh, I've been, I've been munching. I'm okay. You're okay. Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, that's wow. Right. Wow, looks great. I'll bring it down. Oh, that'd be very sweet. I wonder if I'm uh, muted, unmuted, not muted. Can you hear me now? 
I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? You can hear me. I do. Remarkable. Yes. <laughs> but you break up a little bit like yesterday. Yeah, I, just, I, uh, tried, I tried everything, but once again, your voice is more important. All right. Um, if, by the way, if things went dead, uh, Marty, can you hear me now? I, I can. It's just that you break up as you speak. All right, let me try something else. All right, is that a little bit better? Well, so that sentence was better, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to make all the sentences that good. All I was going to say was, uh, if things went really dead, I was going to ask you to talk about uh, Brian and uh, Kurchatov. <laughs> Go with Kurchatov, that's right. <laughs> oh, God, I haven't thought about him in a long time. Yes. <laughs> a crazy guy. Yeah. But the film, the film turned out, the film turned out pretty good. It was okay. You know, the problem was that you know he was fixated on, you know, <laughs> on the script that he wrote, yes. uh, which he wrote before he did the interviews. <laughs> so instead of using the interviews, which were extraordinary uh, access to people instead of using them to do things he kept asking them to say the things that were in his script and you know it was it, it, for a historian it was just very painful you know to watch all of this opportunity just you know run down the drain and uh, and he has a terrible temper and yes. Uh, it, it, it was just, it was, I have never in any other time in my life had a collaboration with someone which was unpleasant. This was, to say the least, unpleasant. Uh, yeah. It was, uh, it was not a lot of fun from my, from my I, end either, but I, I didn't suffer as much as you did. <laughs> anyway, there, there we are. Uh, I hope he's okay. I haven't uh, had any contact with him since the film. Uh, so there we are. Yes. Uh, uh, see, we've been, we've been joined by this woman, Satoka, is, uh, you can see a picture on the screen. She's um, um, from Vancouver, um, but is a translator. Um, and was with, uh, with Peter many times and also on the trip uh, to, to Japan in 2007 when I accompanied Peter, uh, she was there. She was just absolutely wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so I hope she comes. There she is. Hi, I was a bit early. <laughs> oh, I was just yes. checking the link and, and yeah, I came here a bit early. Hi. Hi, nice my name is Marty. Hi. <laughs> It's and Glenn, so nice I haven't to, seen you forever. It's so nice that it's been since 2007. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you look just the same. <laughs> <laughs> you look just the same, yes, you do. <laughs> I don't know about me, though. <laughs> well, you, you, you'll also be on the, um, on the, uh, the uh, event next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Uh, sorry, I didn't get that. Right, I'm, I'm sorry. My sound is my sound is bad. I apologize. Um, I hope you'll also be on the event next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Our time. The second event. Oh, right. Yeah, you're talking about the second one. Yes. You'll be on that too. I think so. If that's well, that's where all the, the, the Japanese the Japanese uh, reporters will be on that one. Oh, right, right. That's going to be 5 p.m. for me. Yeah, so that, yes. that should work. Yeah. Excellent. Ah, there's, our, there's our leader, Peter. Hey, Peter. Hello. Hello. Hello, Gar. Hey, Marty. Hello, uh, Satoka. Hello. Glenn. Okay. You're, you're using a different chair today, Gar. No, same chair. Different color. It was a black last time. Last time. <laughs> 
Yeah, this is the, uh, it always slips down the cover. Ah, okay. <laughs> Same chair. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to try an experiment to see if I can add you all as co hosts because it didn't allow me beforehand because you're somehow not part of the AU domain. <laughs> they said once you're on, it might work. So I'm going to leave you for a second and try to add you. <laughs> Ah, there's Owen. Walter. Hello, Walter. Long time no see. He doesn't have his audio on. He's trying to connect. Thank you very much. This is, this is you know, it's a terrific lunch restaurant. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I stole a soda already. Oh, well, you know, delicious. There's lots of stuff. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking of a beer, but not not very not, not, not very nice. Maybe I can. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, is our sound on? I can't hear anything. Sorry, I need to, to unmute myself. You have I succeeded. <laughs> so, and we've got Owen and Walter, that's great. Um, Peter, they're muted. They're, they're muted. Uh, Peter, uh, when the journalists are asking their questions, they just have to unmute their mic to do that. Or do you, do they need to get permission? No, they just need to unmute their mics. Okay, great. I'm trying to add all of us as co-hosts and it's not letting me. Oh. So hopefully that, that doesn't preclude anybody from sharing the screen. I think that won't be an issue. It uh, it doesn't have me uh, uh, as a host, so I won't be able to see the audience questions if they send them, unless I'm maybe. No, you should still be able to see them. Yeah, but we don't want the questions going to everyone, right? Well, it's not a problem if they do. But we don't want everybody to see the questions. Thanks. You mean everybody who's uh, listening? Or yes. Who's... Well, that's okay. Uh, well, no, it's not because then when I choose some and not others, people will get offended. And oh, I them. see. You mean all the questions as yes. opposed to the one being asked, right? Yes. Okay. Right, right now, on chat is just everyone or Peter. We need to have Barbara on the chat. <coughs> to Barbara. <coughs> Hello, Pablo. <laughs> uh, are Pablo and uh, Yulia, where are they? Pablo <clears throat> would be here. Uh, where is he located, though? Pablo's here in DC. And Yulia also? Yulia is located here, but she had to go out to Portland to cover the protest. She uh, sent me some questions in case Good. she isn't able to join. Good. There's Pablo. Hello. <coughs> Can you see me? Can you see me okay? Or am I... Uh, You're I'm sideways. <laughs> okay. Okay. I have to figure out how to fix this. Uh, Maybe if you well, sit up straight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like a fly on the like wall. Like Fred Astaire. <laughs> yeah. Barbara, can you hear me okay? Because I think I was on mute before. Yes, I can. I can. Right. And, you know, I think we all should stay on mute if we're not speaking. Sure. 
<clears throat> I did mute everybody when they enter, but I think they can override that. Yeah, there's a little button that in the upper right hand corner that says mute or unmute. Yeah. For each of us. So, um, I won't distract Peter while he's trying to. I'm just printing out my notes that I jotted down two minutes ago. And um, how about the hosting situation? Um, it's not working. So, um, so how are we going to do this, Peter? Um, I can. They're going to. It looks like they'll go to everybody. Well, I, I think you should blame Glenn. Say Glenn's in charge of choosing the <laughs> nurse. And, I guess in one sense, we should be so lucky as to have that many questions, right? Better than Marty's doomsday scenario from yesterday. Excuse me? I don't know. In the, in the last half hour, I've gotten more emails about where is it? You know, is there a web page? Can we get the materials afterwards? So. Uh, this this definitely has an afterlife. We have a do we have a plan for uh, using the recording and sending it out afterward to our grandchildren? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're gonna we're gonna it's gonna generate the recording. In fact, it's actually started already. So I'm gonna, maybe I should stop the recording and start again when we start. Yes. Uh, on the internet at, at a later date. Uh, we also will be uh, having a reprise of this uh, same program on Tuesday, July 28th at 8 p.m. Uh, for uh, our Asian, many of our Asian journalists who uh, want to join in the discussion. And so right now I will turn it over to our first speaker, Martin Sherwin. Well, thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. I uh, certainly appreciate your in interest. Uh, I was asked to provide some type of a framework for our discussion. And um, I'll begin with what I think is a question that everybody who does research should always ask. How do we know what we know? How do we know what we know? Well, if we're talking about government decisions, uh, we know what the government tells us. And Truman told us that the bomb prevented an invasion. Uh, and a year and a half later, he asked Henry Stimson, the Secretary of Defense, who was in charge of the atomic bomb project, uh, to write an article and reinforce the idea uh, th that uh, it was important uh, to, drop, to drop the bomb in order to save lives. And Simpson did that uh, in Harper's Magazine in February 1947. The bottom line was there was a choice between using the atomic bomb and invading. That however, was not true. Uh, there were at least two other choices. Uh, clarifying the unconditional surrender doctrine to make it clear that the emperor's life was not in danger. And Stimson admitted that several years later when he wrote in his memoir on page 629 of On Active Service in Peace and War, it is possible, he wrote, in the light of the final surrender, that a clearer and earlier exposition of American willingness to retain the emperor could have produced an earlier uh, ending of the war. The other option was the entry of the Soviet Union. Why was the entry of the 
Soviet Union going to bring the war to an end as American intelligence uh, confirmed. Uh, because the Japanese could not fight a two-front war, because the Japanese were more anti-communist than the Americans were, and the idea of a Soviet occupation of Japan was their worst nightmare. In addition, it was very clear to the Japanese, and it was true, that Stalin intended to take Hokkaido. Uh, so James Burns, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, made it clear in an interview in 1965 with NBC News uh, that, in his opinion, the bomb be dropped before the Soviets came in. And he said, I quote, it was ever present in my mind that it was important to have an end to the war before the Russians came in. All of this information has been available for 50 years. And it's important to think about evidence and why the bomb was dropped. Thank you. Marty, uh, you had a document that you wanted to, to show. Do you want to? Uh... Well, I think we'll do that later. I'll let you know okay. the others. Uh... OK, thank you. So uh, now we'll turn to Kai Bird. Thank you. Um, I want to begin by sort of posing, asking the question about why we can't have a national conversation about the atomic bomb when this country is at a point where we're having very controversial conversations about race and the role of women in our society and uh, all sorts of really tough issues, but we can't seem to confront this issue. Uh, it's verboten. We're still in love with the bomb, it seems. And it's very frustrating to me as an historian that we're now having this kind of a conversation 25 years after the Smithsonian controversy, where the Smithsonian Museum, our national museum, was compelled to censor itself under pressure, political pressure from the American Legion, from the Air Force Association, from Congress. Um, and they canceled a 10,000 square foot exhibit that had all sorts of complicated history and uh, from both sides and grappled with some of the evidence that, for instance, Marty was just referring. Um, but we're still there. We're still hearing in the press, uh, in new books that are being published, uh, people endorsing what is in, in, in effect the official narrative that was put out there 75 years ago. Um, I remember 25 years ago during the Smithsonian, when the exhi exhibit was canceled, the day the final exhibit opened, which is, was just the Enola Gay playing, I published an op-ed in the Washington Post um, critiquing the exhibit and what had happened to it. Uh, about a week later, the entire letters page of the Washington Post was devoted to letters attacking me. <laughs> On what? The issue was, I had said, we dropped the bomb without a warning to the Japanese. All these uh, veterans of World War II piled on, said, no, no, there were leaflets that were dropped. And they were right. There were leaflets dropped the day after the bombing of Hiroshima and the day after Nagasaki. Uh, it, you know, and yet, you know, the, the mythology is, seems to be so uh, immovable. You just can't debunk it enough. So for instance, uh, we've recently heard uh, in the press too and, and in various books, the, the notion that a million American lives were saved. It's not true. This figure was never given to Truman. It was never given to bandied about by War Secretary Stimson. In fact, when I did my biography of, of McGeorge Bundy, I asked Bundy about this because he was the ghostwriter for Stimson of the Harper's article that first used that term, that figure. 
And I said, where did you get it? And he sort of sheepishly said, well, yeah, there were no documents. I sort of looked to see if there were any estimates giving us a, an estimate of how many American lives would have been lost if we had gone forward with an invasion. And uh, so I just picked up uh, uh, the million casualty figure because it was a nice round figure. He pulled it out of thin air. Uh, another story. I wrote a biography of John McCloy that came out in 1992. Um, there's a whole chapter about Hiroshima. And at one point, McCloy, I describe a very critical meeting on June 18th in which Truman, Stimson, uh, I believe General Marshall was there, uh, all the major decision makers trying to sort of discuss whether they should give the green light to a, the planned invasion, which wasn't going to take place for months and months, if not maybe a year. Uh, it was going to take that long to marshal the forces for a major invasion. Um, and finally, at the end, I describe in the, in the book, at, at the end of this meeting, Truman turns to McCloy and says, Jack, Jack, you haven't spoken up. Uh, what are your thoughts about all this? And McCloy is sort of bluntly, he was a very blunt speaking, commonsensical fellow at times. Uh, he says, I think we ought to have our heads examined if we don't realize that there are alternatives to what you're describing, contemplating a full invasion. And then he referred to uh, changing, modifying the terms of surrender to make it clear that we were not intending to hang the emperor, that we were going to have a constitutional monarchy put in place. Uh, and M McCloy said, you know, it's very clear from intelligence that the Japanese are on the verge of surrendering. How did he know this? Well, he was reading the magic cables, our intercepts of Japanese diplomatic cable traffic. And so was Truman. Truman, we now know, in his own diary, refers to one of these magic cables as the cable from the Jap emperor asking for peace. This is, you know, two weeks or more before the bomb was used. They all knew that there were options. They all knew that the Japanese were on the verge of surrender. Um, these historical facts, these pieces of evidence have been out there for decades now. Gar wrote about them in 1965 in his first book, and then very, uh, at great length in, in his 1995 book, The Decision. And yet here we are, we historians know this, and yet most American people, if you ask them on the sidewalk about this issue, they regurgitate the official wisdom. It's, it's very frustrating. <laughs> Barbara, maybe you should now put up that uh, document that since uh, Kai mentioned it too. I need to be allowed to screen share. Uh, so I've asked Peter to let me do that. And uh, when that's, can I do it now? Yes, nope. you can. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, and let's go to, uh, let's see, that's the wrong one. Let's go to this one. Seeing that? Not yet. Nope. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I, how about now? No? Okay. Technical, uh, technical matters are not the strong suit of our program. <laughs> Let's see. Sorry, I'll, I'll work on this and get back to you. Uh, but uh, Gar, why don't you proceed? Okay. Um, let me begin the, the uh, take off of where Kai stopped. One of the ways to get into this uh, complex story is to notice that virtually every, virtually every top military leader of the time, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, 
all of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, heads of the Air Force, Army, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I can give you the full listing and, and we'll have that posted shortly. Went public after the war, almost immediately, almost immediately after the war, saying that the bomb was totally unnecessary. This is Truman had just made this decision. Bomb was totally unnecessary and the war would have been over in a couple of weeks or they said it later. We can go into the document. The documentation is available in many places, but it's in my book, The Decision to Use the Atomic Bomb. But let me give you some quotes on this. Here's Admiral William D. Leahy, President's Chief of Staff, presided, he was presided over the Joint Chiefs of Staff meeting and over the Combined Chiefs of Staff meeting. Quote, the use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima, he was also a good friend of Truman's. The use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender. In being to use it, in it being the first to use it, we adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the dark age. I was not taught to make war in that fashion. Wars cannot be won by destroying women and children. That last line is important. Most of the young men were off, out in service. They were away from Hiroshima. So that meant you had old folks, young people, and not many young men, uh, women and children. And, and he said, I wasn't taught to make war. This is the chairman of the US Joint Chiefs of Staff and the combined British UK Chiefs of Staff. Here's another one. I won't go on. There's about 40 of them that I've published in, in the decision to use the atomic bomb. The famous Hawk, who commanded the 21st Bomber Command, Curtis LeMay, declared flatly at a press conference, the atomic bomb had nothing to do with the end of the war at all. The war would have been over in two weeks without the Russians entering without the atomic bomb, speaking publicly, critiquing President Truman. And here's, here's General Dwight D. Eisenhower. It wasn't necessary to hit them with that awful thing. So on and on and on, uh, we, we're going to post, I think Barbara's going to post 40 of these statements by virtually every major military leader at the time. So that does, that's certainly not definitive proof, but it opens the door to serious questions if all the military leaders, the U.S. government, or most of them, uh, say, say this thing was unnecessary, we shouldn't have used it. The problem is you've got a situation for historians that the decision making was highly concentrated in 1945. The President of the United States was basically being, being advised by his very, very close friend and a very complex Washington figure named James F. Byrne, Burns, who at that time became Secretary of State. And Burns' view, and we don't have records of this, they were private discussions. We have indications, bits and pieces. There are other records about how the, the targeting was done, but the actual decision making was with Burns and Truman. And what we know about Burns's attitude is that he saw the atomic bomb as what he called a major leverage against the Russians in diplomatic matters. And he thought maybe we could end the war early in Man so that the Russians couldn't get very far into Manchuria. And another comment we have from scientists who met with him, it was to make the Russians more manageable. This would be a, Truman called it a hammer on his, that he had over these guys. Uh, the Secretary of War, Stimson, said this is the master card of diplomacy against the Russians, not of the war. So we have a lot of that indirect evidence, and I sh to be clear, that is indirect evidence. We don't have minutes. There are no minutes of the key meetings between Truman and Burns. We have these indications from diaries, the Stimson diary from Burns, but there is mounting evidence, one, that they knew the war could be ended without an invasion. I think that's very well documented. We can go into that evidence. That was, uh, that's simply not true. We also have strong evidence, all the intelligence evidence telling the president when the Russians enter and they had been asked to enter by us, the war is likely to end shortly as long as they can keep the emperor. That is well documented. Then why did they do it? That the indications are strongly that there was one to try to end the war before the Russians got too far into Manchuria that's a diplomatic consideration. And two, certainly for the Secretary of State and probably for Truman, as he said, I'll certainly have a hammer on those boys, speaking about the Russians, very big di diplomatic considerations about what to do about Europe in the post-Yalta discussions uh, at Potsdam, 1945, just before the bomb was, was used. So the story is very, very complex, 
But one thing that is not complex is what the U.S. military said about it, and they say exactly what, what we're, we're saying today. They knew that the bomb was unnecessary, the Japanese were already defeated, and if they were told they could keep their emperor, the war would be over. That was the U.S. intelligence position from April 1945, April. When the Russians come in, tell them they can keep the emperor, the war will stop. No, not even the first landing could begin until November. The invasion itself was set for the spring of 1946. So we know that that's what they understood at the time, and yet they went ahead with the bombing without assurances for the emperor. One last point. The proclamation that was issued at the joint conference at Potsdam 1945, US, UK, and USSR, but only issued by US and Britain, the Potsdam Proclamation warning Japan to surrender, included a very important paragraph saying just what intelligence had said. Basically, you can keep your emperor. And by the way, the US Army wants, it, wants the emperor because it allows us to control Japan using his power. That paragraph that everyone knew was absolutely essential to the Japanese, the emperor was regarded as a god, not simply a man, that paragraph somehow got removed, making it all but, all but impossible for the Japanese to surrender. And so the bombing, the bombing, of course, went forward on August 6th and August 9th, uh, after the Potsdam Proclamation was issued without this exp explicit assurance, which intelligence had made clear, as well as all the intelligence, as well as the intercepted messages. So that's one of the, uh, the difficult and painful things about this decision. It had a lot to do with diplomacy, and probably less than it had to do with the war at that point. Thank you, Gar, that was uh, terrific. And now for our cleanup hitter, we have uh, Peter Kuznick. Uh, let me reinforce some of the points that my colleagues have been making and also add a few additional ones. First of all, <clears throat> so far as the knowledge about the Soviet invasion, the Joint Intelligence Staff of the Joint Chiefs of Staff reported on April 11th that if at any time the USSR should enter the war, all Japanese will realize that absolute defeat is inevitable. They had repeated that on subsequent occasions, including on July 6th. Gar made the point about all of the military leaders. Well, in 1945, the United States had eight five-star admirals and generals. Seven of the eight are on record saying that the atomic bombs were either militarily unnecessary, morally reprehensible, or both. The eighth, General Marshall, said that the Soviet invasion would likely leverage the, uh, the Japanese into surrendering. So uh, the, the, as Gar was saying, the military opinion was clear. In fact, Leslie Groves issued an order to the commanders in the field not to make any public comments about the atomic bomb. When he was later asked about that, he said, I didn't want MacArthur and the others to say the war could be won without, without use of the atomic bombs. Uh, in term, the, what did Harry Truman know? Truman, when Truman became president, he had been vice president for 82 days before Roosevelt died. During those 82 days, he spoke to Roosevelt twice about nothing of substance. People had very, very low regard for Harry Truman. In fact, he did not even know we were building an atomic bomb until after he got sworn in on the evening of April 12th. But Truman did understand a lot about what was happening. And uh, he, he said he went to Potsdam to make sure that the Soviets were coming in. He had lunch with Stalin on July 17th. Afterwards, he wrote in his diary, Stalin will be in the Jap war by August 15th. Finny Japs when that occurs. Finny Japs when that occurs. He wrote home to his wife, Bess, the next night. He said, the Russians are coming in. We'll end the war a year sooner now. Think of all the boys who won't be killed. He shared that attitude with the other top leaders, including Burns and the others. And they all acknowledged that the Japanese were defeated that they understood they were defeated, and that they were looking for a way to get out of the war. For example, uh, the meeting of the Japanese War Cabinet on May 16th 
uh, they issued the following document in which they said, at the present moment, when Japan is waging a life or death struggle against the US and Britain, Soviet entry into the war will deal a death blow to the Japanese empire. Uh, and that was the reality. And the American leaders knew that that was the reality. And when the Japanese leaders were asked afterwards why they surrendered, they said they had to do so uh, be because of the Soviet invasion. The Soviet invasion began at midnight on August 8th. The next morning, all the uh, diplomats met at Farmer, Foreign Minister Togo's residence and said, we've got to accept the Potsdam Proclamation immediately, Potsdam plus the emperor. When uh, Prime Minister Suzuki was asked on August 13th why they couldn't delay surrender, he says, I can't do that. If we miss today, the Soviet Union will take not only Manchuria, Korea, Karafuto, but also Hokkaido. This would destroy the foundation of Japan. We must end the war when we can deal with the US. Uh, now that understanding about the deliberations is now even in the National Museum of the US Navy here in Washington, DC. Their exhibit on the atomic bomb states clearly, the vast destruction wreaked by the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the loss of 135,000 people made little impact on the Japanese military. However, the Soviet invasion of Manchuria changed their minds. So we have the, all these documents and, and there's so much more if we have time. My students sit through a 12 hour lecture on this because it's so important and there's so many, so many documents that need to be discussed. Uh, another aspect that we haven't touched on yet is what the leaders understood. And uh, from the very beginning, in the summer of 1942, Edward Teller was urging the top brass to, to not even worry about the atomic bomb, because that was a trivial problem. So let's immediately go for the super bomb, one that can be made as powerful as the sun, unlimited power. On May 31st, Robert Oppenheimer briefed the interim committee that was making decisions about use of the bomb. And he said that within three years, we will likely have weapons between 700 and 7,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. They knew that. Even President Truman understood that on some level. The first day he was in office, he got briefed by Jimmy Burns. James Burns came up from Spartanburg, South Carolina, and he briefed Truman about the bomb. And Truman wrote in his memoirs, he said it was a weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. Truman got a, better, a fuller briefing on uh, April 25th from Groves and Secretary of War Stimson. And then he wrote that they said that this is so powerful, it could destroy the world. And I thought about it and I listened and I agreed, maybe we shouldn't use it because it, it can destroy the world. On July 25th at Potsdam, he got the full briefing on the bomb test at Alamogordo. And he wrote in his diary, we discovered the most terrible weapon in history this may be the fire destruction prophesied in the Euphrates Valley era after Noah and his fabulous ark. Not a bigger, more powerful bomb, the fire destruction. So the question for us in some level is why Truman, who was not bloodthirsty, was not an evil figure, why he would go ahead and use the bomb in a way that he'd been warned was the most reckless way possible that was likely gonna to lead to an arms race that could end on destroying life on the planet. Now, let me just touch on a, a couple more aspects of that. The scientists, or many scientists, have been signing petitions and urging Truman and the leaders not to use the atomic bomb. Uh, they said it was going to lead to an uncontrollable arms race between the US and the Soviets that could uh, be doomed <clears throat> for everybody. Those documents didn't get to Truman, but he had the basic gist of that in his own comments. Uh, so. And so many of the scientists knew that, uh, Truman knew that, and uh, Leslie Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project, said, there was never from about two weeks from the time I took charge of this project, any illusion on my part that Russia was our enemy and the project was conducted on that basis. Uh, Groves shocked Joseph Rotblat, the future Nobel Peace Prize winner, on, on March 1944, when he said over dinner, you realize, of course, 
that the main purpose of this project is to subdue the Russians. The Russians understood that. In fact, the Japanese have been trying to get the Russians to intervene on their behalf to get better surrender terms. The Russians knew better than anybody how desperate the Japanese were to surrender. So when the US used the atomic bombs, which the Russians knew was, knew was totally unnecessary, all the top leaders in the Kremlin interpreted it as if the bomb was dropped not on the Japanese, but on the Soviet Union, as a warning to the Soviets of what would happen to them and worse if they interfered with American plans in Europe or in Asia. There's a lot more to talk about, but let's, uh, that should be plenty to start with, and then we can all elaborate on those uh, topics. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, the, this has all been uh, really interesting. And uh, we're getting some good questions in on our chat function. So uh, we'll be moving to those pretty soon. Um, the, uh, uh, I do um, want to say that I'm going to call, uh, I'm going to bring up here something else. And uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, since this is a, a conversation aimed at journalists, um, I'd like to ask you all about the role that journalists played in immediately disseminating the news of the bombings and framing the coverage as time went by. Uh, the news, of course, was a huge shock, not just to the public, but to the reporters who had to cover the story. The whole concept of a nuclear explosion was so new that the Washington Star typist, who was taking dictation from the White House correspondent, wrote that the U.S. had dropped an atom bomb, spelled A-D-A-M, like the first human. The story was still making the rounds 25 years later when I started working at the Star. Uh, the journalists involved Bill Lawrence, the New York Times science writer who was given behind the scenes access to the Manhattan Project and at the same time wrote press releases for the government. And then there was, of course, John Hersey, who made his way to Hiroshima and wrote the first story for American audiences in The New Yorker of what really happened. So I'd like to ask you all to share your thoughts on that subject. And uh, Kai, would you like to uh, start us off? I'm now unmuted. <laughs> um, yes, I, that, that's an interesting question and the role of the early journalists in covering this. The thing that I'm really struck by always is that if you look at the, um, the record of the early critics of the bomb, they were actually all Republicans and right-wingers. And uh, the National Review in the early 19, in the 1950s was a critic. Herbert Hoover was a critic of the decision, saying it was unnecessary. And it was actually, ironically, uh, left-wingers and left-wing publications like The Nation magazine that defended the decision. And, uh, and then lo and behold, by the 60s and 70s, everything flipped. And it was the right wing that was defending the, the decision and the left wing that had become, moved in to become critics of it. So uh, I, this is ironic. And as journalists, we should all be aware of uh, the politics of this hot button issue. <laughs> yeah. uh, Gar, you included a chapter uh, in your book, uh, The Decision, uh, about uh, the role of journalists. Do, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, it's, an, it's a really interesting question because, um, in fact, the, my book, The Decision to Use the Atomic Bomb, is a two-part book. It's part on the decision, and then secondly, how did the story we now have become popular and people came to think about it. On the one hand, it, you know, the bomb stopped, dropped, the war ended, and the boys came home, so it seemed obvious. But in fact, what we now know is that, I believe the story we have sketched out here, um, s slowly, the conservative press was very much, just as Kai said, uh, they, they didn't like this at all. And in fact, Herbert Hoover had come to President Truman privately uh, in April 1945 saying, look, tell them they can keep the emperor earlier. We don't need to go forward. There's no need for an invasion. Spelled it all out and had a strong position. The Republican leadership of the Senate was saying the same thing. Tell them, clarify the terms that the emperor won't be harmed. 
and the war is likely to end earlier. You don't need an invasion. The Washington Post was editorializing on this in April of 1945, saying the same thing, April of 1945. And then after the war, the conservative press, as Kai said, began to criticize it in line with what had been discovering the Republican position and the conservative position building up over this time. The, that, that, in fact, that crescendo reached a crescendo by the end of 1946, so that somehow it was felt Conant led this, James B. Conant led the scientific leader uh, involved in the, in the, from Harvard who was involved in the bomb, led this discussion and brought about somehow we've got to do something about all this criticism that's building up. The New Yorker ran the John Hersey article. And there was more and more, in 1946, there's a building up of criticism and asking the questions. All the military leaders had come out after all of them uh, saying it was unnecessary. And so Stimson was wheeled into position and McGeorge Bundy did the ghostwriting for a very important article published in, in February 1947 in Harper's which basically Stimson was a very, very esteemed figure, Republican, conservative in the Democratic. Roosevelt put him in the cabinet to balance it with a very strong, eminent Republican uh, and laid out this position that McGeorge Bundy wrote saying the bomb was absolutely necessary, something that Stimson did not believe at the time. But he wrote this, this essentially propaganda piece and it, it shut down the debate really from 1947 to 1965, 66. So there's a story about, there's a really interesting story about how the press built up the argument and then was squashed and cut off in 1947 and it disappeared for 20 years. So that, that, is, that itself is a really powerful part of the Hiroshima tale. Thank you. Uh, Marty uh, or Peter, uh, Peter uh, would like to weigh in here. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, okay. gonna, I'm gonna yield my time. I think uh, <laughs> we've pretty much covered this subject. Actually, I think not. <laughs> I'd like to take a little bit of issue with what Kai was saying, because I think that a lot of the people on the left were also very much opposed to the atomic bombing. Uh, and we've got statements like Norman, Ta Norman Cousins, famous <clears throat> editorial on August 18th, Modern Man is Obsolete. And he talks about the primitive fear as a result of the bomb. There was a huge one world movement saying that the sovereignty is now obsolete. That was largely a left-wing movement. There was also the scientists. The scientists mobilized at all the laboratories in order to just the opposite of the chemists after World War I. The nuclear physicists after World War II were in the forefront of the movement to ban atomic weapons. Uh, so I think the left was divided. One of the interesting responses is the religious response. Truman was really taken aback when the Vatican condemned the bombing the next day. And it also came out of the Federal Council of Churches, the Commonweal, uh, Christian Century. The religious community was almost unanimously against the atomic bombing. Uh, the public, however, was in support. Gallup issued a poll on, uh, uh, the Gallup issued a poll in August that said that 85% of the American people supported the atomic bombing. In December, Roper issued a poll that showed that 22.7% of the American people said they wished the Japanese had not surrendered so quickly so we could have dropped more atomic bombs on them. 30% in the Southwest held that view. So, uh, but the, the response by the media, I think, is a little more complicated. H.V. Kaltenborn, at NBC Radio and his news broadcast on August 6th said Anglo-Saxon science has developed a new explosive 2,000 times as destructive as any known before. For all we know, we have created a Frankenstein. We must assume that with the passage of only a little time, an improved form of the new weapon we use today can be turned against us. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch said, science may have signed the mammalian world's death warrant and seeded and, and deeded an earth in ruins to the ants. It's interesting how ambivalent the media actually was. And you've got uh, Edward Morrow reporting on CBS. A couple of days later, he said, seldom if ever has a war ended, leaving the victors with such a sense of uncertainty and fear with such a realization that the future is obscure and that survival is not assured. So I think that initially the media was appalled and they were 
article after article that what would happen if a bomb was dropped on your city, on Milwaukee, on Denver, on Dallas, and they show grids of what, how much destruction it would be. So I think that the initial response was much more tempered, which is why, as we were saying, Stimson, first Carl Compton, then Stimson and Truman had to double down with this defense, this triumphalist narrative that this was the only way to avoid an invasion. When, as we know, the reality is quite different. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on now to the uh, journalist uh, questions that, uh, and, uh, and then we'll get to, to other questions that have come in. But the folks who we asked to participate and who've been thinking about this for a few days, we uh, want to get to. And uh, also uh, what I wanted to mention is that the contact information for all of the, uh, of the speakers are posted in our chat. So if you want to reach anyone later for uh, an interview or more discussion, uh, you have that information. <clears throat> so now uh, I'm going to turn to the journalists and I'll ask you each to unmute your, uh, your mic and ask the question. We'll begin with uh, Owen Ullman, who is the former world news editor of USA Today and current executive editor of International Economy Magazine. So take it away, Owen. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. I appreciate it. And I want to compliment all the speakers for a really fascinating discussion of this, uh, this really uh, horrifying event. Uh, my question to any and all of you is, after the horrific damage caused uh, at Hiroshima, why the Japanese did not surrender immediately and why Truman felt it necessary to drop a second bomb on Nagasaki or whether he had already decided he was going to do that? Who, who wants to answer? Let's crack at that. Um, the, uh, first of all, there was one decision made to drop two bombs. Uh, and there was supposed to be four days in between uh, the first bomb and the second. But uh, when Tibbets came back from the Hiroshima run, uh, the scientists on the island said, you know, we think we can do it in three days. And Tibbet said, well, how about two days? Because of, uh, uh, well, uh, no, it was five days and then four days. How about three days? Uh, because there's bad weather coming in. And the scientists said, I think we can do it. I think we can arm that complicated uh, uh, plutonium bomb uh, in three days and they try. And, that's why the second bomb was dropped. The decision was made on Tinian by a lieutenant colonel and, and some scientists. I, I'm gonna uh, interject here with a question from uh, one of uh, the people who's participating, Ed Fields, who asked the question, was a demonstration of the A-bomb considered as an option to end the war? It was discussed but it was set aside with the argument that if we uh, do a demonstration, it will not have much of an effect because we've been wiping out cities two or three every single week in Japan. Uh, why would a demonstration affect the Japanese more than the destruction of these uh, cities? With, with fire bombs, right? Fire bombs and regular bombs and everything else. Okay, thank you. Owen, did you have a follow-up or shall we go on to Dana? I, I just wanted to get a little clarification why uh, Japan didn't immediately surrender after Hiroshima and why it took two, three days later after Nagasaki for them to agree because to an bombing, unconditional surrender. Because the bombing of uh, the destruction of another city was simply the destruction of another city. It was the entry of the Soviets into the war that really threw the Japanese uh, into complete panic. You know, at this point, if we don't surrender to the Americans quickly, we're gonna lose Hokkaido and we're gonna be occupied by the communist Soviet Union. That's what tipped the scale. 
Okay. Uh, can, I next... in, can, I, can I weigh in quickly? Yes. Uh, the point, I, as Marty's saying, the United States, according to Yugi Tanaka's research, had already firebombed over 100 Japanese cities. Destruction <laughs> reached as high as 99.5% <laughs> in the city of Toyama. 99.5%. Japanese leaders accepted that we could wipe out their cities. To them, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were more horrible, but they were just two more cities. What changes the equation for them is the Soviet invasion. Uh, and, and that, because their whole Ketsugo strategy was based upon waiting out the Americans, having the Americans invade, inflicting heavy casualties on the United States, and that way getting better surrender terms from the Americans. But once the Soviets invaded, that whole strategy was out the window. And so that's why they discuss that in their uh, immediate meetings. As General Kawabe, the deputy chief of staff said, the atomic bomb was bad, but it was the Soviet invasion that made us surrender. And we've got other Japanese leaders who said the same thing to American interrogators after the war. Okay, thank you. Uh, and for those of you who are keeping an eye on the clock as uh, we're getting close to two o'clock, we have the ability to continue this conversation uh, until at least 2.30. So not to worry, we'll, get, uh, we'll be able to get to uh, everyone's questions. Uh, next, I'd like to call on Dana Priest. Uh, she's a former Washington Post reporter and column columnist and is now the John L. and James S. Knight Chair in Public Affairs Journalism at the University of Maryland. Dana? Thanks for having me. It's been uh, fascinating to listen to this. It's not really a subject that I know that much about. Uh, and so I want to go back for a minute to something Kai asked in his um, opening remarks, which is, why can't we discuss this? So you four probably know better than anyone since you have tried. Uh, and then the second part of that would be, and what if we did and came to the conclusions that you all have come to, what would be the implication of that for uh, war making, bomb making, other things today? Uh, Kai, do you want to start? Uh, you know, my instinct is to say that the reason we find it difficult to have a conversation about this subject is that we embraced the bomb afterwards and we built many of them and we relied on it for our quote defense and we're still doing so at great cost billions and billions of dollars so it it questions a fundamental aspect of our whole strategic position um, I don't know, but Marty has a, a brand new book coming out next month or in September um, that addresses some of the, in part, this issue. So maybe Marty has a better answer. Well, I, I don't think I have a, a better, but uh, uh, I, I, I can, you know, say something else. Um, the, the emergence of the Cold War uh, was intimately connected with nuclear weapons. And once, uh, once the Soviets got the atomic bomb uh, on, in August of 1949, and we were engaged in a nuclear arms race, the idea that we had used the bomb inappropriately, that the bomb was something that should never have been used, that it was too horrible a weapon uh, to use, uh, became anathema in the context of the political environment in which we lived. Remember, there's McCarthyism. And the 1950s, when all of this was set in stone, uh, was a uh, politically very narrow environment for criticizing or discussing anything that touched on uh, the Soviet Union uh, being a, um, uh, doing anything right. And the argument that, well, the Second World War in the Pacific 
was ended because the Soviet Union entered, not because we dropped the atomic bomb, was something that the national culture uh, simply couldn't get its arms around. And we are living with that uh, legacy. Anybody else? Well, we are 45 years later. <laughs> what would be the implication if, uh, if we were able to open this up and come to this conclusion? What do you think that would mean for anything today? Well, uh, um, let, me, let, me, let, me let me just say one thing uh, that may be useful. Stimson, the Secretary of War, a very conservative man, a uh, very honored man, and a uh, man I respect, uh, made a, an attempt uh, with the help of McCloy just after the bombing to somehow say, look, and he came to Truman and he came to a cabinet meeting. He said, this thing is too dangerous. We've got, if they see us with this weapon, rather ostentatiously, the Russians see us with this weapon ostentatiously on our hip. They don't have one, ostentatiously on a hip. They will distrust us. The only way to work this out, I've learned over 70 years of life, is to somehow be honest and straightforward with them and try to get a handle on this and establish what we would call arms control or disarmament uh, somehow at that time. Uh, he made the talk, at the, made his speech, uh, went away, and that was the end of it. Burns took control of the, of the process, took control of Truman for about a year until Truman fired him. Uh, but there was no interest at all in what we would call arms control. Instead, they were developing uh, the bikini tests followed and more and more bombs were built. And of course, the other side knew that there, they had to build their own as well. Uh, so there's a story that follows all through 1946 and 47. And then as the, as the problem begins to be de debated and discussed, as I mentioned earlier, in the press, and there was a wonderful John Hersey article in The New Yorker, I went to Hiroshima and, and interviewed a lot of people in the, the summer, late summer of 1946. There was a buildup of people saying, this, something's wrong with this. And, and it was shut down by Stimson who was wheeled in with McGeorge Bundy's help to, to say, look, the bomb had to be used, something Stimson didn't really feel that strongly about during 1945, but he shut down the conversation until, until the 60s when it began slowly to open, and it's still not, not widely open in, in American dialogue, although many, many, many parts of the world, uh, what we're talking about today is, is widely understood. I'd like to take a quick crack at it also. <clears throat> A lot of it had to do with the veterans, and the veterans believed that the atomic bomb saved their lives. They thought they were going in and many of them would be killed. Mm -hmm. um, Paul Fussell from Princeton wrote a book called Thank God for the Atomic Bomb. He said he was one of the ones who was going to go in and he said we cried with joy and relief when the bomb was dropped. And that idea has persisted. Susan Rice in late 2019 had an op-ed in the New York Times and she said her father was ready to go over and Truman dropped the bomb and ended the war and that's, and, and his fa her father didn't have to go. But I think that this idea is central to the whole notion of American exceptionalism. It's what Marty was getting at in terms mm -hmm. of the Cold War against the Soviets. Yeah. If the US gratuitously dropped the, its atomic bombs in a way that unnecessarily slaughtered hundreds of thousands of people and put the rest of the humanity uh, under threat of extinction, uh, what would that say about our notion of ourselves as being good and generous and benevolent as opposed to those Soviet dictators and bullies and thugs? Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's so central to our sense of ourselves. Kai brought up the Enola Gay exhibit before, and the people who mostly oppose the Enola Gay exhibit were the American Legion and the Air Force Association and the veterans rallied, uh, didn't want an honest discussion of this at this point, because so much of their own sense of identity is tied up with their service in World War II. And so anything that casts mm -hmm. doubt upon American goodness in the good war is something that people didn't want to hear or think Peter, about. Peter, just to jump in here, Dana's question is, what if we actually had an honest reckoning today with among the American people. How would that change things today is her question. What, what, what's the implications today if we were to embrace our, if most Americans were to embrace the narrative that Marty's book in September is going to come out with? 
uh, would we still rely on nuclear weapons? Would we still, we're, we're spending a, a trillion dollars, as I understand it, to modernize our current nuclear weaponry. Would it's we actually continue up, to do that? Actually up to $1.7 trillion now. Oh, okay. And it's gonna hey. modernize and make more efficient every aspect of our nuclear arsenal and make them more, more deadly, more lethal. We have an audience question uh, along those lines of how does this relate to today's debate over, this is from Elliot Negan, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, in today's debate over whether the United States should spend more than one trillion on a new generation of nuclear weapons and delivery systems. Let me take a I'm very, I'm very concerned, concerned about, about exactly, exactly that, that question. question. Hiroshima's got more to do with the future, future than it has to do with the past. The past. Are, are, are you, you getting an echo? I think, case, I, I I think we need to echo. mute some microphones, please. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm going to have to do it. How's this? Better? Yes. Yeah. The, the Hiroshima, I think, has much more to do about the future than the past. The, uh, the issues that we're now facing are all about a trillion dollar and more. 1.7 is the number buildup of nuclear weapons, which is going to force the Chinese and everyone else to build as fast as they can. We have been extremely lucky so far that one of these things hasn't gone off at some point in some place. There have been many accidental scares. There are possibilities of strange possibilities of war uh, in Pakistan and India. Uh, the reason to talk about Hiroshima is partly to take a hard look at what we've done as a nation and to reconsider our past, but also to begin a new discussion. It's been very quiet for a long time of, of what these weapons are all about. I don't think we're going to be lucky for another 75 years. If uh, I'd like now to turn to our next uh, journalist questioner, and that is uh, Walter. Walter Pincus, who's a former Washington Post reporter and columnist and now contributing senior national security columnist at the Cypher Brief. Welcome, Walter. Walter, turn on your, turn off your mute. Walter, we need you to uh, yeah, unmute yourself. It did. Um, Good. Let me first look back at this conversation for a minute because I'm going to come on to um, some material that I've written about uh, in the past. And that is my reading of the history. And I think there's a problem of reading, going back in history and looking at things that weren't available at the moment, things happen. Uh, it's a lesson I learned working for Senator Fulbright during the Vietnam War, when most people forget that a majority of Americans were in favor of the war. And it wasn't until Nixon decided to back off before the public at large wanted to get out of the war. Uh, the atomic bombs were built as terror weapons. They weren't built to fight a war. They were built to end the war. And uh, when the targeting committee, which included Oppenheimer and Conant and Simpson, uh, sat down in the White House and decided to pick out two targets. And two was the number because they felt if we dropped one, the Japanese wouldn't think we had any more. And so the idea was to drop two. It was also useful because the Hiroshima bomb had never been tested and was uranium and the bomb dropped on Nagasaki was a second type of bomb, uh, plutonium, and they wanted to have two bombs, and they didn't have that many more following them. Uh, so they wanted to make an impact and end the war as quickly as possible. <clears throat> they were terror weapons. 
and always start that way. Um, because the targets picked out starting with Hiroshima. Uh, and if you read the meeting uh, at which they decided on the targets, they wanted to find a city that had a military facility, whatever it was, but that was surrounded by civilian population. Um, and that's what they said, and that's what they did. Uh, so it was always thought of as a terror weapon, a different terror weapon, because as you've heard, we were, we were killing civilians starting in Tokyo with a firebomb um, and needed something that was much more impressive. That's why they did it. All these other things were talked about, and in retrospect, you can find documentation. And as people said, uh, it was possible that the Russians entering would have done it, or it's possible something else would have happened. But they were facing the situation as they saw it at that moment. And at that moment, they thought they were going to have to invade. Second thing I'd like to say, which is that so many of the military talked uh, against it afterward, as did Oppenheimer. Uh, I've covered nuclear weapons in the last 40 years. And I will tell you that uh, a majority of people who run STRATCOM, who are in charge of the weapons, once they retire, will openly talk about how they are against using them. And the military in particular, because they, they're not useful. They don't know what's going to happen afterward. Uh, I'll go back to the original bonds. Most people don't realize, by design, they were detonated at 1,200 and 1,500 feet above the ground to get the maximum blast and the maximum heat directly below the bomb. They were fearful, the scientists were, of what would happen if the fireball hit the ground and you would then have fallout. Because fallout is not directly below in the city. We realized that people moved back into Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those who weren't killed, and rebuilt the city uh, within months. Uh, they moved back in and they life return. Uh, these days, these bombs are aimed at the ground or at targets below ground that would cause fallout. And you couldn't, it'd be, it wouldn't be Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it'd be Chernobyl, where you don't go back for 30 years or 40 years. So that leads to the question that I wanted to ask, which touches on what said a minute ago, and that is to ask historians why they think it's not been used again, although we built thousands of them. And yes, I know about all the accidents, and I know all the almost happens. But the fact is, uh, if you hadn't had Hiroshima and Nagasaki, once they started building them, uh, it could have been so much worse. And I, I would argue that right now, the reason they're not used, haven't been used, they're essentially political weapons, diplomatic weapons, uh, is because Hiroshima showed how terrible they are and how they really are terror weapons. They are not war fighting. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, say something immediately. Um, uh, first of all, I'm uh, a little stunned at um, uh, Walter's comment. Essentially, you've painted the United States uh, as a terrorist state. Uh, and uh, the implication is that maybe uh, the bomb delayed the end of the war. Uh, if it wasn't for the bomb, uh, 
existence and the interest in using it, it's quite possible and probable that unconditional surrender would have been clarified much earlier. And it is possible that we delayed clarifying unconditional surrender uh, until the bomb was used. Uh, so, you know, it seems to me that uh, this is not an argument that holds up at all. If the bombs had never been used, if they had not been validated as weapons of war in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, if we had said our values prevent us using such a horrendous terrorist weapon, there may not have been a nuclear arms race. History could have been different. So I don't think you can argue that Hiroshima and Nagasaki have prevented World War III. You should live, live enough, and one day, if we keep this up, it is going to happen. It is almost inevitable. Who, who else wants to weigh in? <laughs> I'd like to. <clears throat> uh, Walter, in, in terms of the bomb versus the invasion, uh, we dropped the bomb first on August 6th, supposedly to prevent an invasion that wasn't scheduled to begin until November 1st. So the first thing about it is the timing. Why do we drop the bomb to prevent an invasion? It's not going to start for three more months uh, at a time when we know the Japanese are trying to surrender. I don't think there was ever going to be an invasion, uh, certainly not after we developed and tested the bomb. Admiral Leahy wrote, I was unable to see any justification from a national defense point of view for an invasion of an already <laughs> thoroughly defeated Japan. So I think that that's part of the misunderstanding here. Um, so far as the bomb is a terror weapon, Certainly it was that at the end, but initially it was conceived as a deterrent. And when the United States started to develop it, when Einstein writes his famous letter on July 16th, 1939 to Roosevelt, it was because we feared that Germany was developing atomic bombs and the Germans were ahead of us. And scientists thought they were maybe two years ahead of us initially. And so we wanted a bomb as a deterrent to prevent a, a German attack on us. There was never any thought uh, for, for the first few years of using the bomb against Japan because we knew that Japan couldn't develop a bomb during the war. But then later, then all of the other diplomatic and other considerations that we're talking about come into play as the tensions are emerging. Truman becomes president on uh, April 12th. He meets with Molotov on April 23rd. And at that meeting, after 10 days in office, he accuses the Soviets of having broken all of their Yalta agreements. Uh, and he, then he bragged, I gave it to him one, two to the jaw. Molotov said, I've never been talked to that way in my life. Truman says, carry out your agreements and you won't be talked to that way. Uh, but right from that point, the positive relationship that the US had with the Soviets under Roosevelt had eroded. And it's gonna go up and down over the next period, but there are a lot of other considerations that come into play. And the military one for using the bomb is I think uh, hard to justify. Well, let me just say one other part of the history. And that is while they were developing the bomb, you talk about, I mean, all war is terrorism. I mean, the idea that, that you uh, firebomb Tokyo and killed 100,000 people and consider that just not terrorism, but warfare. All war is terrorism. But I'll tell you, the early idea when they were wor working on the bomb, Oppenheimer uh, and I think Lawrence talked about what about if we can't make it work as a bomb, why don't we drop it just the radioactive material and the damage we could do in a city or even in the countryside affecting crops and things like that. And he decided to set it aside 
because they were making advances and it would take longer to have an effect on the enemy. At that point, Germany, as you say, Germany was the threat to build a bomb. But to look at it in retrospect, um, the Cold War brought on this arms race. Uh, and it's, uh, it became a numbers game. And you have this foolishness even today in which, because the Russians have low yield, lower yield, uh, but still five kiloton low yield weapons that could destroy a city. Uh, we have to build the same kind of thing even though we have thousands of bombs, yet we could make that low yield. There's an irrationality that's developed about the bomb. But I still go back to my earlier statement that it, it's irrational, but essentially it has stopped having a confrontation between us directly with the Russians. Um, let me make one uh, one last comment about this. Um, I think it would be fair to say, uh, and I think Walter would probably agree, that his argument that the bomb may have prevented another use of the bomb, that was not the purpose of it. That was not how they saw it at the time. And I, I, I think I disagree with the argument, but nonetheless, what they thought about at the time was not that. And they certainly knew that the war could be ended without an invasion in almost all likelihood and without the atomic bomb. The Joint Chiefs of Staff got the British Chiefs of Staff on the basis of joint intelligence at Potsdam before the bomb was used to convince Churchill to go tell Truman, you've got to tell him to keep the emperor because our intelligence says that will end the war. The bomb, they argued, were, they argued that there was an alternative at that time. But the notion that I think Walter has said is that 200,000, mostly women and children and old people, the Japanese young men were away at war, were sacrificed as a reminder that we shouldn't go forward and use these things again. I don't think that was in anybody's mind. And indeed, it's, it's kind of a horrible thought to think about. Let me jump in here a moment. Um, you know, I think it's important to remember that from the perspective of the scientists, Robert Oppenheimer and others, they were building this weapon because they feared the Germans were going to build it. That's right. They knew the Germans were going to, they knew the German scientists, and that was their greatest fear, that they understood that, that the German scientists whom they had studied with uh, were perfectly capable of doing the same thing that, that they were doing in Los Alamos. And they feared that they would build a weapon and hand, it, hand victory to Hitler. That was the nightmare. Then once they're on the verge of testing this weapon, it suddenly is, you know, gets into the bureaucracy and Groves needs to test it. And it having spent $2 billion, there's, it's only human. You want to be able to demonstrate the, the utility of this weapon. Uh, and then we get into all these arguments, but uh, Walter's perspective and question brings us back actually to Marty's opening statement about how do we know what we know as historians. And, uh, and it, we, it brings us back to Dana's question about well, why can't we have this discussion nationally? Why can't we grapple with this? And, and you know, if, if we can't look at the evidence in retrospect, and Walter is suspicious of this. He says, oh, this is, the historians are finding this and that in the diaries here, and, and they're rewriting history. And this is, in fact, the suspicion of many, you know, the average American that historians are out there rewriting the history. But what, what do we do when Harry Truman's handwritten diary is only discovered in the late mid 1970s. And we find in there him scribbling in his diary that the Japanese are about to, to surrender. That actually 
you know, that compels us to put the whole narrative in a different context. And it proves that we didn't know in 1945 what we thought we knew. Does that make sense? <laughs> Walter, have I convinced you that we need to look at diaries and put them in context and new, look at new evidence? I mean, I've spent the last, what, 15, 20 years writing how terrible the weapons are and arguing that it ought to be debated and it isn't. Uh, the reason we have so many is because people refuse to talk about it as, as how terrible they are. But I think it's much more important to talk about what they, in today's context, talk about what they can do today that people don't understand than it is to worry about why didn't we not use them 75 years ago. You can't close your eyes and say, uh, we got that far, we tested it, we never should have used it, and nobody else would try to make it. Uh, it it's eventually going to happen. It, watch what's going on with cyber. If you want to see how things develop and you can't stop. Can I, can well, I make a that provocative point? note, uh, we're, we're getting uh, running short on time. Peter, can we go beyond 2.30? Yeah, we can go as long as we can go are. as long as anybody's still sitting here. Okay. But I want to make uh, one quick point in response to Walter. Marty's new book ends with 1962. So it, and there's a lot of focus there on the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so the argument that we learned from this, and that's how we've avoided nuclear war since then, I think has to be questioned. Because uh, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, as much as Kennedy and Khrushchev tried to avoid going to war and nuclear mm -hmm. war, but they both realized that once these crises develop, they run out of control. And they both felt that they had lost control of the situation in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we didn't survive because of statesmanship. We survived because of pure blind luck in that situation. Uh, so, and, in, and what I think we need to do in judging Truman or others at the time, is look to the people who also were existing at that time who had a very different perspective. It's not just us applying our modern or contemporary critical acumen to dissecting what the decision makers decided, but they had many of their contemporaries who were horrified by both the strategic bombing and by the atomic bomb. And when Stimson says to uh, says to Truman, I don't want to see us getting a reputation for outdoing Hitler in atrocities in, res in regards to the strategic bombing campaign. There were many who understood how, un how wrong that was also. So there were people at the time who were critical, who saw it very differently than did Truman and some of the other policymakers. Well, let me do one more thing and I'll quit. Uh, Marty is right. Uh, we were on the verge of something really terrible, and it did get partially out of hand. I interviewed McNamara one time, who said uh, when they were waiting for Khrushchev's answer to the famous cable, uh, he didn't know whether Washington would exist after he had given Kennedy his first briefing on what would happen if an intermediate range Russian missile hit the US. Uh, but the fact is, the lesson was learned during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it led to uh, the hotline, it led to both the US and the Soviets going out of their way to make sure there was no direct confrontation, initially between US and Russian troops and then even the time of the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict, when they, the Israelis were threatening to use small weapons, uh, making sure your allies didn't have a direct conflict. So Cuban Missile Crisis got us as close as we're going to get, and that lesson was learned. Thank you. Um, 
we'll uh, move on now to our next questioner, um, and that is Pablo Pardo of El Mundo. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, first of all, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, and thank you for, I mean, for the chance uh, to learn so many things. Uh, so this is really, really, really uh, very interesting and informative uh, for me. And also for being with these colleagues that I've always read and I never thought that I could be in a panel uh, with them. So I'm kind of, uh, I mean, flabbergasted and, and shocked by that. So thank you very much. Um, I like to, I mean, I could grill uh, the panelists uh, with with questions and, and with comments. Uh, I will try to, mm, I mean, to limit um, my my turn to just a couple of things. Um, one of them is, why do you think, and any of you can answer uh, this, why do you think that nowadays uh, nuclear bombs uh, and nuclear weapons, they belong for the public opinion, uh, by and large, and also for the media, to the realm of historians. Uh, there are like 12,000, approximately, I don't know how many, uh, nuclear weapons in the world. But, uh, I mean, in the last 25 years, we have been forgetting about them. Yeah, of course, I mean, the current administration is going to spend $1 trillion uh, in improving the U.S. Uh, nuclear arsenal. But, I mean, it's something that is not considered like big news. I mean, today we talk about uh, cyber war, we talk about um, other types of, of uh, weapons, uh, but this has completely disappeared. Uh, and I mean, I, I grew up in Europe in the 80s, and then at the time we were completely obsessed with the Euro missiles, with the SS-20 in the Warsaw Pact, the uh, Pershing uh, missiles in the, uh, in the NATO side. And, um, and no one uh, today thinks about that. So, I mean, nuclear weapons, they seem to be like something that is simply collecting dust and is never going to be used, which I think is a rather danger, dangerous uh, thought. So I would like to know um, from the panelists, uh, what do they think this is happening and how can the media and the, and the academic community to raise some awareness about this. This is one of the questions. The other one that I would like to ask is, based on the case of uh, Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki, uh, it's always very interesting how the decision was taken by a small group of people, many of them uh, civilians. In the last two decades or so, uh, in the West, particularly in the United States, uh, we have had the example of uh, some big international conflicts that were started by civilians who were much more optimistic and much more, for lack of a better word, let's say trigger happy than the military. Um, and I'm talking, I mean, Iraq is the, is the best example. Um, to what extent this could be a risk with nuclear weapons as well? Because we have this idea that, okay, nuclear weapons won't be used by any government, they can only be used by rogue actors, essentially uh, terrorist groups. Um, but as long as nuclear weapons are in the hands of responsible people, or at least people who are not necessarily responsible, but surrounded by responsible people, Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, Bibi Netanyahu, Donald Trump, whoever, Emmanuel Macron, uh, there's no danger of a Dr. Strange Love scenario. So these are my two questions. Thank you very much. Well, I think there's always a danger of um, a Dr. Strange Love scenario, number one. Uh, number two, I would um, uh, suggest that uh, dealing with nuclear weapons, uh, in effect, creates a level of irresponsibility along with the responsibility. And uh, nobody can guarantee that a series of untoward events uh, will not lead to a decision that leads to uh, the worst decision 
uh, using nuclear weapons. And the fact that you suggest that people are not thinking seriously about the danger of nuclear weapons now, as they did back in the 1980s when the SS-20 was, you know, such an issue, uh, in my mind, increases the danger of the possibility that one thing or another could lead us down the wrong path uh, to a disaster that nobody wants. And that's the great danger. Pablo, uh, I see the danger risk now as very, very high. In January 2018, the experts at the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists moved the hands of the doomsday clock to two minutes before midnight. That was in the aftermath of the nearly going to war with North Korea, with Richard Haas, the chair, the head of the Council on Foreign Relations, said it was a 50-50 chance he thought that we were going to go to war with North Korea in late 2017. U.S.-Russian and U.S.-Chinese relationship right now are in terrible shape. In, uh, in February of 2019, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists moved the hands of the doomsday clock to 100 seconds before midnight. That's the closest it had been since they started the doomsday clock in 1947. Now, what we also know, which is really ominous, is that the latest studies about nuclear winter show that what Sagan and the others had said in the 1980s was actually underestimating the threat of nuclear winter. The estimate now is that even a limited nuclear war between India and Pakistan, which 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons were used, could create partial nuclear winter, send millions of tons of smoke, dust, debris into the stratosphere, block the sun's rays from reaching the earth. Temperatures on the earth would plummet to freezing. Agriculture would be wiped out in many parts of the world. That limited nuclear war could lead to up to 2 billion deaths in the latest scientific estimates. There are not, not 100 nuclear weapons. There are close to 14,000 nuclear weapons. They're not Hiroshima size. They're between seven and 80 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. So the, the chances of what, what we're talking about really are not so abstract and irrational. Um, right now, we've got two people on the planet who have veto power over the future existence of our species, Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. I don't think anybody should have veto power over the future existence of life on our planet. But that's the situation we confront right now. Uh, Peter, I'm going to uh, chime in here with a question from uh, Yulia Okovskaya of Russia's Channel One, who uh, wanted to be with us but uh, wasn't able to get in electronically. So she sent some uh, questions in writing. And one of the ones that she mentions touches uh, exactly on what you were just talking about, which is uh, how uh, how did the uh, nuclear, the use of the nuclear weapon influence Soviet foreign policy. And another member of the audience says that Russians, uh, Russians have made very clear that their nuclear policy is defensive only. Uh, how would you assess Russia's nuclear policy and how it's evolved since 1945? I would say that Russia's nuclear policy has been largely reactive. That uh, they, when they knew the U.S. was going to use the bomb, they sped up their own bomb research. They all saw themselves as being the target of the American bomb. Uh, so the Americans dropped the bomb in August of 45. The Soviets test their first atomic bomb in August of 1949. They were four years behind us. The Americans test their hydrogen bomb in 1952. The Soviets test a prototypical hydrogen bomb in 53. Not quite a full hydrogen bomb, but they had closed the gap. And then after Sputnik, the Soviets had first intercontinental ballistic missiles, and the U.S. Start, the U.S. officials started exaggerating. Uh, by a, a magnitude of 100 times, in many cases, how many in, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles and bombs the Soviets actually had. But the Soviets were playing catch up. And after the Cuban Missile Crisis, they vowed that they would never be forced to back down again 
because they were so far behind. And then they start building up their nuclear arsenal. I take my students to Hiroshima and Nagasaki every summer since 1995. This is the first time we're going to miss it. And I'd always go to the A-bomb museum. I take them to the A-bomb museum. And I find myself year after year writing down the same statistics that by 1985, the world had accumulated the equivalent of 1.47 million Hiroshima bombs. I couldn't get over how insane we became as a species. How many times do we need to be able to kill everybody on earth over again before we're satisfied? And now if Trump has gotten rid of the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, the INF treaty, the Open Skies treaty, and, he's, and he says he doesn't like the uh, New Star treaty either. If we do away with the New Star treaty when that expires in February of 2021, we could go back to a 1980s style nuclear arms race. Trump says he welcomes a nuclear arms race. Fortunately, he probably won't be in office uh, long enough to carry that out. But um, uh, it, it's, it's still is a very, very precarious situation. And I see the Soviets, I mean, the Russians now, Soviets before, the Russians now, as playing in many cases the same game the US is playing. Whereas China has actually very, smart, very sharply limited the size of their nuclear arsenal. What they understand is that you don't need 7,000 nuclear weapons in order to pose that kind of threat. Even a couple hundred nuclear weapons is enough to wipe out the United States or any other country. And so they've limited theirs. They've also said they don't accept the first use doctrine, which we hope is uh, gonna continue. Yeah, uh, Marty do, uh, or uh, Kai or, or Gar, do you want to weigh in on this question? I want to, uh, Marty, go, your, your mic is off, Marty, go ahead. Right, maybe it's better that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, one, one of the interesting historical uh, incidents that relate to what we've been talking about, the insane accumulation of nuclear weapons during the Cold War, 60,000 of them, and the numbers that you wrote down, Peter. Uh, uh, one of the triggers for that occurred in 1950 when Truman made the decision that the United States would respond to the Soviet test with uh, a crash program to build a hydrogen bomb. Uh, he told uh, the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, the Secretary of Defense, uh, and the Secretary of State, uh, that he was going to approve a crash program, not because he intended to use nuclear weapons, but because that they were very good um, instruments for dealing with the Soviet Union. And we had to have more than them in order to negotiate with them successfully. So we lost the sense that these weapons were uh, strictly for deterrence, they were for diplomacy and negotiation. And therefore, there was no limit to the number of weapons that would be good for increasing our negotiation power. Uh, and there we were. Uh, by, the 19, by 1960, well, let me step back. When Eisenhower came in office, uh, there were about, I think, 1,200 nuclear weapons in the American arsenal, somewhere around that number. When he left office, uh, there were about 22,000 nuclear weapons. They had become the foundation for American foreign policy and American diplomacy. And that was what the Soviets were reacting to, as Peter made, uh, the point that Peter made. Let, let me jump in with a brief uh, comment here, because I think the why dig into the old Hiroshima story is, is an important question that I'm often asked when I lecture about this. And I think what it opens up is something like the questions we're beginning to discuss right now, the fragility, the ease with which decisions are made for the wrong reasons, 
The bombing of Hiroshima was unnecessary according to virtually every top military leader in the United States government at the time. The war was over and they knew that the war was over. The invasion wasn't coming till spring. The first landing couldn't occur for three months. There was very little fighting going on. The reason to go back to this decision is partly what Marty's saying, what Peter's saying. We are on the midst of a massive arms race. One of these days, one of these is going to go off. It is not beyond the United States politics to uh, elect people who are irrational or skeptical or dangerous. It is time again to begin a discussion of the importance of getting some control on this massive destructive possibility. Random events alone are likely to lead to more explosions, and these things are simply too, too dangerous to allow for that. I mean, I, I, as a historian, but also as someone who worked in policy at the higher levels of the State Department and in the Congress, that is the question. Not only Hiroshima in the past, but how do we begin to reassess how decisions are actually made now and the emerging dangers and the deafening quiet, the deafening quiet about nuclear weapons that is all over the world and needs to be reopened. Kai, uh, would you like to uh, make a, another comment? And I think this will be uh, the end of the program for now. So uh, would you like to make a, a comment on, on this or things in general? Uh, well, I guess I'd like to end on the notion that maybe someday we, we can have a national conversation about this difficult subject. And uh, again, coming back to Dana Priest's question, I think her question was very good. You know, what, what difference would it make for us today? And I think we've gotten some answers about that. It, it, $1.7 trillion modernization program on nuclear weapons is very expensive and dangerous. And these weapons are still very dangerous. Um, I, I, my fear actually is, uh, the use of a dirty bomb in the Middle East um, using medical waste. It'd be very easy, technically speaking. And uh, also we've mentioned India and Pakistan and Kashmir, there could easily be an exchange there too. It's just, you know, it's, it is, it's a shame as Pablo has says that there's no, um, no concern about this, no discussion. Um, and that's, that's in itself, as Peter says, uh, and as Marty has emphasized, that makes it even more dangerous that people are not focused on this. So we may w wake up one morning uh, with terrible news and we'll then all be discussing this terrible issue. Thanks. Well, that, that seems like a very good point at which to end uh, today's program. And, and with any luck, today's program will have uh, perhaps helped to spark some more thinking uh, and discussion of it. And as I said, the, pro uh, the program itself will be available, uh, the recording will be available online at a later date. And uh, we will be repeating this uh, for uh, our friends in Asia, uh, but uh, you're welcome to join or tell your friends uh, to join at uh, eight o'clock on uh, Tuesday, July 28th. Uh, thank you to the audience. You're, uh, I think most of the questions that you posted were answered along the way, uh, and I was able to uh, work in some of the questions. So thank you very much. I appreciate, uh, appreciate all that. And with that, I would like to say a hearty thank you to uh, our, our speakers, to the journalists who uh, led the questioning, uh, I'd like to say a special thank you to Peter for uh, getting this organized and, and using the facilities of American University to make all of this possible for us technically. And to uh, Glenn Marcus, uh, a, a PBS executive and a documentary producer who assisted in pulling all of this together. So with that, thank you very much. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you for another event. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks, Glenn. <laughs>